Okay, amazing. It's four o'clock. I see a lot of people coming in. A lot of you already here. Hello, everybody. Very warm welcome from New York into the world to, uh, to Germany, to the UK, wherever you might sit. And it's great to see you again. And thank you very, very much for being with us today and also for inviting us into your homes and into your offices and wherever you might sit and, and watch us actually. And I see a lot of you are turning on the cameras as well. That's great. If you if you're not shy and if you feel like it, please turn it on. That's actually really great for us also to see who's in the audience. Makes it a little bit more more analog and less virtual, I guess. My name is Catherine DePaul, and I'm the program uh, manager here at the German Center for Research and Innovation in New York. And we're part of a network of five centers in total. One is in Tokyo. They also are partner today. One is in Moscow. Then there's one in Sao Paulo, and there is one in New Delhi. Actually, and we're all here to kind of promote and showcase innovation, um, in our case, transatlantic innovation. And it's really, um, it's, a big, it's a big task for us, actually. How do you showcase innovation? I think one part of showcasing innovation definitely goes hand in hand with um, how do you communicate that? And you have to communicate innovation in very innovative ways, right? Not just your typical uh, presentation of a paper. And we thought about, well, what are different presentation forms? And then the DBE How, the German Center for Research and Innovation here in New York, came up with two series dealing with science and innovation communication. And we had a fantastic event on science storytelling last week. And we're continuing this week with actually visualizing your research and your innovation and your science and what have you. So we're very, very excited to, um, to host a, a new series. And it's called Visualize Your Research. And you are the kick off audience for this new undertaking. As I said before, we're doing this together with the DBEH, so that's the Center for Research and Innovation in Tokyo, but also with our partner here in New York, 1014. And we have Ben uh, Wagner here, who will, be, who will be moderating the event. He's the program officer at 1014, a fantastic space for ideas. That's how you describe it. And I think that says plenty in all of it. And what's really exciting is that you're always. Um, integrating the digital world, the, the digital realm and everything that you do here. I'm also very, very thrilled that to kick out the series on visualizing your data, we were able to find an open slot in Georgia Lupi's calendar, um, as she is without question one of the most influential voices in the field of data visualization, and she's really, really busy. So welcome, Georgia. It's fantastic to have you here. And in order to not to make this too long, um, I'm just going to mention a few things that you're doing because the list is really extensive and it's kind of like writing a dissertation almost. But I want to mention that you have a million plus views on your TED talk and it's it's growing and that your work is featured in really prestigious institutions like the MoMA here in New York, for example. We received a Cannes Lion and um, an Information is Beautiful Award, which I think is fantastic and is, is a very special award as well. You're a trained architect, you're a designer and information designer. And you're a partner at the renowned Pentagram here in New York. And you also co founded Accurate, which is an internationally acclaimed data driven design firm with offices in Milan and New York. I mean, the best cities in the world, I guess. We have it both, absolutely. And what I think is most exciting to us about you, and hopefully also to the audience, is that you coined a very important phrase, and that's the notion of data humanism. And you will probably speak a little bit about that today as well in your, in your talk. And data humanism for us is very important because we're trying to tell you know, stories with data that we gather and collect around us and not just for the sake of data or numbers at the end of the day. So it's fantastic to have you here. Thank you, Georgia. Thank you, Ben, for coming also. And I'm going to leave the stage to you in one minute. So it's me, you know, saying hello. Then we have Georgia doing a talk. Then we have a question and answer moderated by Ben. But we also have something very special for you, the audience. We will raffle off three of Georgia's books, Dear Data to three lucky winners and I will have a random number selector on my cell phone and then go through the list and we'll announce the winners after the Q&A. So stay tuned and stay with us for sure. Last little bit of housekeeping for the Q&A, you can either raise your virtual hand or you can type your question in the chat or you can write a Q in the chat and then Ben will call on you and know that you have a question actually. So again, it's wonderful seeing you and I'm gonna step aside now and Georgia, it's all yours. Thank you. Hi, everybody. Thank you, Catherine, for such a lovely intro. I'm really, really excited to be here. Um, obviously, I would have loved to 
you know, uh, having done it in person, but I think we're getting there. So maybe this is one of the last virtual talks. I don't know. Thank you everybody for joining. I know that there are people from different parts of the world, different time zones. So I'm really, really thrilled. Um, I will talk about data today. I'm about to share my screen. There'll be a lot of inspiration. I would suggest you to just feel inspired and like take it in. Again, my talk today is not going to be about what to do with data in terms of how to visualize it. It's not going to be any class or teaching. It's really going to be more about like, how can we think about data differently? Uh, and I'm going to share my screen. Um, so I'm, I'm going to stop my video now because over a year of virtual talks, it happened quite a few times that with video and presentation, everything crashed and I don't want it to happen. So I'll say hi and bye now and I'll see you in video uh, as soon as I am uh, done with the slides. So um, sharing my screen. Can just somebody confirm that you're seeing a slide? Yes, I, I see some nodding. Uh, well, all right. Uh, what I'm going to do with you today, hello, uh, I will explore the intersection between information and again, specifically data and design. And I believe it's a pretty crucial moment in time to have such a conversation as Catherine was saying. Um, but a little bit about me, I define myself as an information designer. Um, and that means that every day with my team, I shape and design the different ways my clients and their clients access different kind of information, and particularly in my case, data. But data that can be qualitative and quantitative, big and small, data that organizations already have, or actually that most of the times, as you will see, crafted by myself and my team in collaboration with our clients, and that data that we then represent visually, translating numbers and quantities into images through data visualization and through building interactive experiences with these visualizations. Um, I'm a partner at Pentagram, as Catherine said, which is um, an independent design agency made of 24 partners. This is us before the pandemic. I was split between New York, uh, where I work, London, Berlin, and Austin. And Pentagram structure is pretty unique because we partners are all practicing designers and we serve as the primary content for every client and each of us have our own team and clients and and this is because we really are passionate about what we do i mean we're not managers but we're really really designers uh, at the core um, so this is what we do. Pentagram is almost 50 years old and my partners way before I joined have contributed in shaping our collective visual culture for almost the past 50 years through graphics and identity, but also products and packaging, editorial design, book design, installations, advertising. I'm sure you recognize some of these previews. And what I introduced with my team is data as one of the languages that we could use to communicate across experiences and across platforms. But let's pause for a second and start with the definition. What is data? So for many of us, data feels not so connected with real life and it might even have a nebulous meaning often associated with numbers, technology, and algorithms only, and often seen as scary, complicated, cold, inhuman. But there is another approach to what we so coldly call data that has always interested me more. That is to always remember that data is an abstracted representation of our reality and therefore a lens, a filter that we can use to see our world through. So any aspect of our world and especially our human nature in our society, one subject at a time and once more then a narrative material to base design experiences on. Um, and so I will make a few quick examples to give you an idea of the variety of projects where data can be used this way before digging into the core um, of the ideas that I want to share today. So, for example, to give you a sense, in the past year, we spent from working with newspapers and magazine. This is a very early collaboration with the Sunday Cultural Supplement of Corriere della Sera, which is the main Italian newspaper, where from 2012 to 2014, we designed more than 40 data analysis and visualizations, but probably not the visualization you would have expected to see on a national newspaper in 2012. Um, every week, we looked for data on a main topic, combining and overlaying different information on cultural and social phenomena with many layers of context that we visualized with a unique language that was created and crafted specifically for the data stories we found, as you can see, with a legend that always guided the readers to understand um, how to read the visualizations, so rich visualizations for a rich uh, supplement. 
Um, two completely different projects creating physical installations with data. This is the recent Starbuck Research Roastery that opened in Milan. We redesigned a data visualization carved in this big brass wall, uh, the wall that actually you saw to the left uh, at the entrance that now is just, you know, seen in um, uh, as a facade. So using different carving techniques, perforation and lightning to represent different data points, depicting the timeline of the history of the brand, the coffee making process, process and the places in the world that have been fundamental for Starbucks history. So once more data, qualitative and quantitative to tell stories. Um, and in this case, again, to give you the variety of the variety of what you really can do in this case, a wall that can also be experienced through an augmented reality mobile app that we designed and developed that brings this data to life. So adding a digital layer that interacts directly with the physical space of the wall and where the wall is turned into to a living artwork with access to many data-driven extra content. Um, to creating experiences such as activation events with data. This was for TED 2017, where we created what we called data portraits of all the people who were the main conference in Vancouver. Um, so images that were based on people's answers to a series of questions about their work-related stress, the way they get their best idea, how much they freak out when they have unread inbox numbers that piles up, as you can read um, to the right. And so answers that have been translated into a unique hand-drawn data-driven image that people at TED were wearing on top of their badges, and they would use them to identify similarities and differences with other people at a first glance, they really as an experience excuse to introduce themselves like an icebreaker to start a conversation that was much more meaningful than saying, hello, I'm Georgia, I'm an information designer, what do you do? So here in this case, really creating an experience around that. And last example, to even more meta type of projects, such as this work we have done for IBM, where in 2017, we designed instead a system of guidelines for all their data products, all their data visualization. So first of all, guidelines on how to work with data visualization effectively on a daily basis. So nothing uh, really spectacular here so far, keep it simple, um, understanding how to not make mistake, what charts to pick. But then the interesting part is that we designed guidelines that could translate the great design heritage that IBM has built over the years into how they work with data. So we have taken literal vision inspiration from the design of IBM from the past, and we designed guidelines that would make their chart look and feel like IBM, um, even venturing into looking at physical objects, part of the IBM tradition. So exploring how the textures of numbered rows and columns uh, on the punch cards look like single elements that can be interacted with on a data visualization. Um, but let's get back to data. So I believe this is a particularly interesting moment in time to advocate for data to become a language that everyone should learn how to speak and use. Because think about this, in the think about this. In the past 15 months, we passed from a population where only a few of us cared about data to a population where every single person out there relied on data and charts every day to decide how to act in the pandemic, where maps and diagrams have been the general population daily vitamins, I don't even have to tell you, and where terms like flattening the curve as are almost colloquial. So the past year has been a revolution for how much people know that data are present in everyone's life. So there has never been a better moment in time to advocate for everybody to become data fluent, to become data literate, but not only to learn how to read a chart, but really to fully understand the human aspect and the human possibilities of what we so coldly call data. And we as designers, uh, as myself, can really make a difference here, I think. Um, because data are our actions, our activities, our emotions. Data are the events happening in the world around us, but also our relationship. Data are us, are our life. And, and they are as much about the numbers as they are about the context. They are as much as what it is in the data set as they are about the way they have been collected, what have been left out, the way they have been interpreted. And so they are as much about facts as they are about story. And this is how I'm talking about data today. So uh, excuse me for the long premise. Um, so I'll show you some experiences in detail to hopefully inspire you and make you eager to learn this language and to teach this language. 
And I will start with a very radical experiment um, that is probably one of the projects that people know the most about me, uh, where no technology was involved. Um, it was a self-initiated project that after years of working pretty much only on digital experiences and with quote unquote big data sets, really reconnected me to the very nature of data. It's called Dear Data. It's a collaboration with London-based designer Stephanie Pozovic. Uh, so Stephanie and I met only twice in our lives where we decided to run this weird experiment around one main question. Is it possible to get to know another human being through data only? And so for Dear Data, every weekend for one year, we used our personal data to get to know each other. Personal data around weekly shared mundane topics from our thoughts and ideas to our most intimate feelings, from our belongings to our apologies and laughter. So 52 excuses in form of data to investigate and reveal a particular aspect of ourselves and about our days. And then personal data that we manually would hand drawn on a postcard sized sheet of paper that was sent every week from London to New York, where I leave and from New York to London, where she leaves pretty obsessively for one here, uh, where the front of the card was always a data drawing uh, and the back of the card contained the address of the other person, of course, and the legend. So how to read our drawings. So Stephanie and I collected our data manually to force us to focus on the nuances that computers and devices cannot gather, or at least not yet, <laughs> using data to explore our minds and not only our activities and getting insights on the things that really matter the most to us. So, for example, in week number three, we tracked the thank yous we said and received, um, who they were for and from, what they were about, if it was really meant. Uh, and in this example, you know, by looking at my week through the lens of this particular layer, I realized that I thanked mostly the people that I didn't know well, like waitresses, waiters, strangers, but I kind of didn't thank enough the people who were close to me. And when you see it, it really jumps at you. And so we started to look at our days through data, such as in this other case where I mapped my complaints, borrowing literal visual inspiration from the music notation system to show the repetitiveness of my complaints over time, but not only quantifying the number of times we performed a certain action, instead adding context and details about why, what was happening, what was the situation and the feeling, realizing week after week how to put ourselves in these numbers and the importance of adding context and qualitative aspects to make this data truly representative of ourselves. So over 52 weeks, we mapped our envies and what the feeling triggered in us. We mapped our desires and what they told about us, our emotion and decisions, apologies, and many more, creating these intimate portraits of ourselves to share with the other person through this invisible layer of data. And I guess you start seeing the, the, the importance of the qualitative aspects uh, of the work that I do. In this case, data that are much more interesting than what we usually associate with personal data collections, such as number of steps, expenses, patterns, calories intake. Uh, this is, there's really much more to these images and these data that we can explore. And this is true for small and big data, for personal data and beyond. Um, Dear Data also became a book that is one of the ones that will be uh, given away today. Uh, that is his, at, at, at its third edition. Um, and the original collection of postcards has found the most exciting home as they've been acquired as part of the permanent collection of the Museum of Modern Art, which has been quite nice. But what excited me even more is that Dear Data has been so well received from the public outside the data community. We've seen thousands of postcards made by people, not even designers or artists who learned about the project and wanted to experiment on themselves. Even teachers of any grade using this format to teach their students the world of data, starting from human observation, from human question, as opposed to what's already there. Um, so you've seen that we can turn even the smallest details of our lives into data that we can look at to see things from a different perspective. But besides personal data, we can do this anywhere. So I'm often asked, where do you find data? And lately I'm replying more and more that I often design my data sets. Um, and you'll see what I mean with this other example. So in 2017, I had the great honor to collaborate with Paola Antonelli. She's the senior curator for design and architecture at MoMA and with her team on a piece that closed the show that was called Items, Is Fashion Modern? So the show that was in MoMA, some of you might have seen it if they were, if you guys were in New York, uh, presented 111 items of clothing and accessories that, that have had a strong impact and influence on our culture. 
even just reading the list, it was super fascinating. So from the bikini to the burkini, from the Patagonia fleece jacket to the balaclava, the little black dress, uh, the Dr. Martins, the Levi's 501. Um, and I've had the incredible opportunity to create a site-specific hand-drawn after the data visualization to guide visitors to explore the features of the items, both individually and as part of a bigger ecosystem. But what is interesting here is that I didn't have any data. I only had the list of the 111 objects and the background research that the curatorial team conducted on each of them. So I put on the glasses of the data collector and I delved into these 111 stories in search for bits of quantitative and qualitative information that could help me answer a few main questions to really understand and reveal why was each of the items included in the show. So to reveal the curatorial process uh, for such an important culture, uh, cultural show. And the question that I asked to build my data set were, for example, is the item a medium or a message? Meaning, is it iconic and included because of its technical and aesthetical features or for what it represents? And uh, if they are a message, which type of message? Are they worn to conform to a movement or to escape to a movement? Meaning, has it become a way to blend into a social context or to break free from it? And many more of these kind of questions. So crafting a data set from these questions where the data were absolutely not in this form before this analog um, process. Um, and then each of the items became a symbol that I drew on the wall, position and visualizing according to all of these set of attributes that you've seen before that I built together with the curators with a legend on the left side of the wall to interpret it. And the whole point of my exercise was to start from the final manifestation of this process and to work backwards. So really reconstructing the invisible layers of data, the invisible data set that Paula and her team used as an input for their design, even without knowing it. And then making it visible for everybody to see through the lens of data, something that to me is very valuable. And in similar situations, we don't see these invisible layers, first of all, because we often don't observe and collect these more qualitative and human types of data, but also because we still don't have all of the visual languages needed to embed this data. We still have to experiment and explore beyond bar charts and pie charts, and this is very exciting and promising. Uh, and I would say much needed, especially beyond the more artistic experimentation. This is this is another project that I'm about to show you. And I wanted to uh, to pause in saying then today I'm showing you intentionally very explorative and speculative projects in the hope that they can inspire us to think about data in a different way, even in the more traditional manifestation of data. And so this next project is still artistic, but tackles, I believe, a very important matter, which is data in the medical field. This project is a collaboration with my dear friend and guitar player, Kaki King, um, that started from an unfortunate moment. So two, uh, three years ago, Kaki's three years old daughter, Cooper, was diagnosed with a condition called ITP, which is an autoimmune disease where her body attacks her platelets, then leads to spontaneous bruises, burst blood vessels called petechiae all over her body, and in the most terrifying cases, even internal bleeding. So for, for, for four months, I wanted to help Kaki make sense of this situation and speak with the doctors. In for, for four months, we collected and combined quantitative data from Cooper's test and qualitative observation from Kaki. So data from her life, her whole level of stress, what she could observe on Cooper's skin and the May episode that happened. And we decided, she decided to share this very personal journey, but not with words, but through this data that I visualized in a way that you wouldn't probably expect from medical data because these data are intimate and very intense and personal so i asked myself can a data visualization also evoke empathy and activate as also at an emotional level and not only at a cognitive one so i started to structure this fluid timeline to tell the story of these four very hard months for kaki and her family every symbol you see here represents a data point every white petal is a day the rhythm is broken every time that Cooper was admitted to the hospital to check her platelet count uh, and the burst of red dots represent this value. Um, so you see, it's not a linear timeline because time was not perceived as linear uh, for from from Kaki and uh, and her family and, and time is never perceived as linear. 
But then, you know, adding on, we have all of the data as observed by Kaki herself, like in the purple splotches to represent the visible bruises and their intensity. So you kind of like want to look for like white days where Kaki couldn't really observe significant improvement increases in the bruises. And then I added pink dots representing petechia, the blood marks on her skin and how spread out they were. I'm just going to zoom back for a second as the visualization builds up. Then when Cooper was taking steroids and having medications, you will see these gray shapes affecting the days. Um, other symbols are for when Cooper had had some incidents that caused her skins to worsen, such as she fell at the park or she was bitten by a mosquito. But then there also all that was going on on Kaki's life and in her mind. So Kaki used to tour a lot to travel for concerts and she felt very stressed out when away from home in this particular period of time. And this is indicated with these black dots on the day she was gone. Uh, then in these dark months, there have been positive moments though, such as fun birthday parties for Cooper and her brother or a, a great Halloween night that I represented here as these bright yellow spots that cheer up the visual in a way. And lastly, Kaki also kept track of her own level of hope and fear for the day that she reported on a scale of from 1 to 10 on both emotions that I visualized through these floating lines. The darker lines are for the fears and the orange lines are for the hopes. And all around, we added Kaki's personal notes for the day that I hand um, wrote around. And uh, what's also interesting is that this visual was used as a musical score by Kaki to create a piece of music that she composed directly from the Ford Mouth of Data collection, where the time of the song represent what was happening in their life exactly as the visualization. And I will play part of the song for you guys, and I will like to ask you, um, to like you to see if you can feel something through this data. So just for the sake of time, um, I, I I couldn't share it at all. I'm almost very emotional after I show this project. Everything is on my website if you want to see the video. But what I wanted to go with it is that, as you can probably see, this is not by any means a scientific representation of data, but still, I think it paints a pretty complete and sensorial picture of this very personal journey. And many people living similar experiences told us that the visualization made them really feel part of Kaki's stories in a way that probably a blog post wouldn't have. And I don't want to say that this can lead to any scientific breakthrough in the medical field. This is not the point of my work. But once more, I believe there is a world of unexplored, small and intimate data that we often don't see if we are applying a straightforward definition of what we think data is. A layer that we also don't see because visualizations often focus often focus on the numbers and not on what the numbers actually represent. So what if, for example, hospital and doctors could also speak this type of languages to us and vice versa? And I know many of you are wondering, Cooper is absolutely fine now. She's out of the danger zone. She's healthy and thriving and she says hi. Uh, so that's, that's the important part of it. 
And I will definitely end with a lighter note uh, that perhaps can make us think about data as a true storytelling material that we can use everywhere. Uh, this example is one of the most exciting projects I've worked on. It's a fashion collection that I designed for the fashion brand and other stories, uh, which is part of the H&M group. A collection where the graphic patterns printed, embroidered, sawed um, on the fabric are the direct representation of, I think, again, very human data points. Um, in fact, I went and looked for data into the achievement of three unprecedented women who've been pioneers in previously male-dominated fields and who paved the ground for how the women to get started and thrive. Uh, these women are Ada Lovelace, Rachel Carson, and Mae Jamison. Um, there's somebody who's asking me to annotate the shared content. I need to approve or decline. I don't know what to do. Let's do approve. Um, all right. Uh, otherwise, I couldn't skip forward the slides. So for these three women, I crafted data sets about their major accomplishments. So really what they did, their achievement, and then background information on their lives. Data that I then used to create the visual patterns that we will see displayed in the collection. And so hopefully beautiful patterns that you would want to wear that also have a meaning behind them. So the first woman is Ada Lovelace, born in 1850, 1815. She's considered now to be the first computer programmer in history. And it, it was super fascinating. It was the first time someone programmed a machine to do complex math. As a matter of fact, originating the discipline of computer science. And I analyzed and visualized the structure and the mathematical form of the algorithm that she wrote. And in parallel, I was looking for visual inspiration in pieces of art that could reflect the nature of the data I was working with. So geometric, repetitive, but with variation. And in this last project, I also wanted to share a bit of like behind the scenes so that you can see um, a bit of the process behind it. So then I started to sketch different ways in which each of each one of the 36 steps of the algorithm and its variables could be represented. Um, these are different sketches, starting also to sketch how to display them on a piece of garment, because obviously designing for a magazine or for an exhibition or for a video piece is different uh, than designing for um, clothes. This is a selected option with vertical elements, one for each of the 36 steps of the algorithm. And you start seeing how the repetition forms an interesting visual motif. And each one of these 36 line of Ada's algorithm is one element with internal dividers representing their variables. Without really entering into details, you can see from this legend that every symbol, every color and divider every, um, and graphic element represents a data point from the algorithm. So this is the final pattern from Ada that leads onto the silhouettes that we designed. Uh, and here are some ideas that I crafted on how to place it all over or as a bolder accent um, or more creative placement. Uh, and these are the final pieces. So you see that there is one pattern that get repeated and creatively placed. So you clearly see that this is one piece of pattern for data that then um, gets creative. Um, then as part of the process, there have been a lot of back and forth between design, testing, and samples. And as part of the shoot for the publicity, a beautiful model was posing as I recreated the legend behind her. So really telling customers, even with the publicity material, that um, you know there's a story behind what they're wearing. And the process got repeated for the other women. Rachel Carson, she was the first environmental activist. And with her book, Silent Spring, that was published in 1962, she really, I mean, Silent Spring is the classic that launched the environmental movement. And so in this case here, I went and looked for data in the structure of the content of the book, building my inspiration around more organic shapes uh, as the nature of what Rachel was working with. Um, and here are some first sketches where every element could be a chapter of Rachel's book. And here I build the pattern. So every radial element is one of the 17 chapters. The lines are the number of paragraphs and their lengths. Um, and on their left, there's the aggregation of core structural elements, such as number of words, punctuation, and sentences. Um, and building on top of it, I went and looked on the whole book to see what were the nouns and adjectives that were mentioned the most. Just zooming in here. And then I looked how much they have been mentioned in each chapter. And that was the way to build the final chapter, the final pattern with the 17 chapters um, with different background colors. And uh, these are the final silhouettes. You know, you get the point. I'll, I'll go a little quicker, placing patterns in different way on the fabric as I did with Ada, uh, getting bolder with the sweaters. 
with a wetsuit and then became a body for production reasons. And here we go with the final pieces. Uh, they're really precious. Again, you can see that there's one pattern uh, that then really get repeated um, and that can get, you know, placed creatively on the materials. Um, and, you know, they really did such a great job with the embroidery and the details. I was really, really happy and excited about the final pieces. And the model, we are in them for the shooting, for the shoot. And finally, Mae Jamison, born in 1967, still alive. She has been the first African-American woman astronaut. Um, I visualized the orbits of her 1992 space shuttle mission. And in this case, taking visual inspiration from circular patterns, like recalling orbits, starting to sketch the orbits possible features, and finally landed on this version where one circle is one orbit. We will have 126 of them. This is the final pattern. And the symbol that you see above the black dot represents which day she orbited around Earth in September 1992. Wait, this was the legend. Uh, and the colored shadow represent the time of the day for the orbit. So an homage to her mission and on the color of the sky and, and of Earth as she saw it from above. And then on the background, the other symbols represent all of the experiment that she performed in the nine days. So from radio transmission to zero gravity investigation, really a homage to everything that happened um, on the mission. And again, elements of the collection as we thought of them initially, possible placement, shirts, and there they are. Once more, a pattern that you can clearly recognize, but you know, for the sake of clothing production that then we uh, use creatively. There's also an extra puffer for the winter. Again, Nikita, the model wearing them. And for each of the women, we also designed a T-shirt where we extracted one element of the pattern only as a bold signature. So really you can see how from data you can design an entire collection. And finally, when customers bought any of the garments in store, they got a paper bag that I designed containing the pattern and the legend. So how to interpret what's in the texture, which again, for me, it's always a crucial point of my work. And I know that probably not everybody will nerd out dissecting Ada's algorithm from here, but at least they really know that what they're wearing has a deep meaning. Um, and what excites me about these projects is that it's, for me, another step further to demystify data. So, for example, I see this specific project as one of the possible evolution to the graphic T-shirt with a written message. You know, the written messages that we have uh, on branded T-shirts. In this case, the fabric itself becomes the message where every feature of the garment is deeply connected to information and messages that we are proud and happy to carry around us. And the reason also I'm particularly interested in these less conventional but perhaps more popular projects with data is their potential to reach a far wider audience that might start thinking about data in a different way. And uh, they also might start caring about certain data and therefore certain topics more. This is the last project I'm going to show kind of quickly for the sake of time. Um, so recently we released a pro two projects around the topic of climate change in the hope that presenting data in an engaging and surprising way could help people be more aware and possibly change their behavior. This is an experimental work we released for Google Arts and Culture. It's an alarming, if you will, interactive experience about airborne microplastic that we call plastic air. Um, so do you know what happens to plastic items when we dispose of them? They degrade into smaller and smaller pieces called microplastics which then end up within the air that we breathe, floating all around us, even if we cannot see it. So when you enter the website, you're shown a sea of multicolored shapes floating across the screen. It is a speculative window onto a data-driven approximation of plastic particles that exist around us. As you interact, you can drop identifiable objects that you use every day to pollute the sky. And then you see the items breaking down into the air, starting to contribute to the sky becoming more and more dense and filled with these particles where the shapes and colors are depiction of different sizes and characteristics of the microplastic element that we every day drop. 
You can zoom in and zoom out and select each particle, revealing uh, their chemical composition and what household items they might have come from. But you can also toggle between seeing and not seeing the particles. If you choose to look away by selecting don't see, you see the plastic in their more familiar form, sometimes obvious and sometimes surprises, and you can still inspect what they're made from. And this second state is like, look away, don't see, shows this object floating through the atmosphere almost comically, suggesting the urgency and absurdity, I think, of this type of pollution. Uh, then the color of the sky changes according to your location, mimicking the passes of time and the different, um, yeah, I needed to click for this video to open, uh, mimicking the passing of time and the different lights from daytime to nighttime. And you can also adjust factors like location, cities versus rural areas and weather conditions like wind, rain and snow to see how this affects um, the dispersal of the patterns. So these are some of the different moments. Um, and of course, you can learn more and read all the studies that have been made and especially what you can do to lessen the pollution in our sky. And the design of the experience speaks to the synthetic nature of the material with a plastic inspired color palette that is bright and shiny, the opposite of the dirty pollution the people normally associate with the environmental issues. And in fact, the subject might be scary and daunting, but we think that designing the website to look beautiful and appealing to users like Plastian themselves could really even make them care more. We really wanted the experience to be engaging, to encourage people who land on the website to spend some time with it and share it with their friends and hopefully really think about their behavior and their virtually, and, and, and as they virtually deposit uh, and, and find this depositive activity compelling for a funny oxymoron to actually understand the consequences of the plastics that we use every day. So the plastic, uh, the, not the plastic, the website is up and running uh, and you can go and play with it. Uh, you can easily find the link on the Pentagon website or on my social channels. Um, and so to conclude for real, I hope you have seen how data can be and deserves to be a language that all of us can speak fluently and that we can use for all sort of experiences and communication purposes. After we have learned how to look at data and what are the aspects to put emphasis on, which, as we've mentioned from the beginning, are the human aspects, the human side of data. This is really what me makes people relate and care. And over the years, I build my approach and practice around what I call data humanism, which is a renaissance, if you will, where data is truly for everybody and also unique to anyone, where talking about data will mean talking about its intimate qualities in conversations that will be shaped around subjective and even imperfect aspects where data-driven design is replaced by design-driven data because we will design the ways we will approach data depending on its unique context each time uh, where data will be used more in conjunction to the word people than to the word numbers and where ultimately instead of using data to become more efficient we will all data we will all use data to become more human um, data humanism to me means always to design ways to connect numbers to what they really stand for and then through design making this new knowledge available for everybody to access um, so I'm really excited about the possibilities opened up by this way of looking at data in this very moment in time and um, I hope you are too uh, so thank you for now thank you so much Georgia that was a fantastic presentation um, amazing examples and and what a what a ride and what a like <laughs> just a spectrum of different uh, designs in the digital in the analog world Thank you, Benjamin. I, I, I think um, I'm all, I think I'm on time. I didn't go over, so uh, try it. Amazing. Yeah. Thank you so I, much. And you probably didn't read along in the chat, but I did, and you um, already got like so many complicated uh, compliments for your amazing, oh. um, very aesthetic and often almost poetic work. So uh, thank you for much so much for for sharing these. And before we go into the into the Q and A, um, I just want to also invite everybody to. Um, ask questions in in a little bit. You can already think think of your questions. I 
noted a few down that were already in the chat and I'm going to uh, pose them to you just now. I also have a few questions uh, prepared, but like for everybody else who's who's been listening, um, you can um, ask your questions either by posting them in the chat or you just write a cue in the chat or you raise your hand and we will invite you to, to unmute yourself and ask your question uh, directly at, at Georgia. And um, please keep it short and simple so, so that uh, we make the most of, of the time that we have. Um, now let's start um, with, with a question more about um, science because um, this, this um, event today is part of a, of a series called Visualize Your Research. And I'd like to speak about visualizing scientific data a little bit. Um, like um, lots of data that we that we see today in in scientific works, it is bar charts, it is eye charts, it's it's diagrams. Um, for and your work is like exactly the opposite. Um, can you can you give some advice to let's say students or researchers who would like to just kind of, yeah, communicate their work that they put so much, you know, dedicated so much time into to to visualize that differently. Like, how would I start doing that? Yeah, well, thank you, thank you, Benjamin, for the question, and thanks everybody for posting so many questions and comments in the chat. Um, I, as I mentioned today, I specifically showed the most experimental work to really try and inspire, like at a forward-looking level. I think. Um, the way to go for visualizing data really always depends on the context, on the goal, on the audience, on the type of data. So it's a little hard to give a one um, unique advice. I think in general, it's always about, first of all, figuring out. So who will be, of course, the people who are going to read it? What are they expected to? What do they know already? And what is something that we really might want to communicate to them? And like, what are they, what is their attention span? Is it digital also, or is it printed? Will they print it out or not? That will really, really uh, take tell you a lot about how far you can go. If you've seen, I mean, really designing for clothing or for a mural in a museum or for, you know, experimental projects that will go on a book or a digital experience um, can have a lot of freedom. What I will suggest to try and not necessarily fall into the, oh, let's do a bar chart or let's do a spark line is if you didn't have a chart in mind already and you really were thinking about what is in the data here, what is the most important thing? Think starting to thinking about what I call the architecture of the visualization, like if bar charts didn't exist, like if the charts that you usually pick from didn't exist, so that you sort of like create a way to visualize the data that are more intuitive for what you find in the data. Then obviously there are traditional forms that we always gravitated towards. So of course, if there's a timestamp, you end up probably visualizing data over a chronology, but what are the elements that you can add um, to the data that you have to make people relate more, to, to make the chart feel more interesting. I really believe that in most cases, there's a value in producing beautiful charts that can really um, drive the attention, like really get people's attention to get curious and to get a memorable chart, uh, you know, that then people can remember. And as for the advice, I mean, I personally take a lot of visual inspiration, as you've seen from the uh, and other stories project from, um, let's say, pieces of art or visual visuals in the world that I'm attracted to from musical notation scores to nature to uh, repetitive and uh, geometric patterns, then it's really about finding your language language and finding the right language for every project. I mean, I, I'm, I'm sure this is not really a good advice advice, but it's the way that I would approach, uh, you know, visualizing scientific data. All right. Yeah, we've had a question in the chat before um, that was about where do you get your data from? Uh, like, how do you gather your data and what do you use to analyze it? Again, it really, really depends on the project. So. As I showed for the MoMA example, I didn't have any data. I have such a high pile of like really research and uh, I wanted to find a framework to start thinking about these 111 objects in a way that could help people have a big picture. And so you start asking questions and building your data set. I mean, obviously you cannot really do it for every, pop for, for every topic. I mean, many times you have data that are already there. You have a client that gives you data, but all the times that you can actually think about, wow, okay, there's there's a 
there's a potentiality and an opportunity here to go and put on the glasses of the data collector to help people see more and better out of a pole of unstructured information, then how do I build my data set? It's really about the questions that I ask, because if you think about the items project, the one at MoMA, I could have just simply said, okay, every item is categorized by timestamp, the location, you know, geographic location that they were first launched at and the number of items sold. Well, that would have been way less interesting than really thinking about how do these pieces make us feel in relationship to the cultural fashion movement. So I think there's not a right and wrong way. It's really about what is that you feel people will care about the most in that situation as that audience. I mean, many times we think the data is objective, but it's not because it's about how you collect them. And so it's always kind of like a journalistic endeavor in a way, uh, especially when you have to collect your own data. Obviously, then, if you have three sources of data about climate change that you need to um, consult and build the data set out of, well, definitely that the, the, the sources are the subjective selection of what you're going to display. Um, but, but no, that, that, that's pretty much, you know, how I do it always is really figuring out, right. If I had the possibility to tell a story, what I think that will engage people the most and what I think that is the opportunity for generating new knowledge here. Right, we are we really so so used to like two dimensional data uh, presentation to kind of um, yeah, and it seems like you're doing the opposite. You're adding complexity. You're asking like, what else could I add? What what could be interesting to communicate in here? Um, and even though it might yeah, and really inviting readers or viewers to dive into it, to read it like a book, to spend some time with a data visualization. Uh, but let me let me um, ask you a question about the beginnings because I'd like to know: Were you always interested in this? I know you're also trained as an architect. Um, when did data visualization start for you? Was there like specific moment? Um, did you really like math? Did you really hate it? What was it? <laughs> I liked math. I always found numbers beautiful, but I always, always, always liked drawing and like artistic practices so much. So I think the reason why I decided to study architecture back then, I mean, I didn't know like 20 plus 20 years ago, I didn't even know the data visualization was a thing. And so architecture for me, I always say that was my way to merge the need and the, the my need for numbers, organization, structure and, and scientificity in a way, but also my passion for creativity and, and expressing myself visually, because ultimately then, you know, there's this composition aspect of architecture that uh, that is kind of like really open. Um, and I always have loved systems and I find architecture as a sort of like a systemic way of thinking. Then there's there's an anecdote that like in, in hindsight, in retrospect, I, I say, but of course, I mean, I didn't know it back then, that is like, I think I've always been a data collector. I remember, and my mom and my late grandmother, my late grandparents remember the pleasure that I had when I was a little child to spend time on my grandmother's tailor shop. So she was a seamstress and every day I would like lay out all of her belongings on the table according to different rules. So for example, one day would be button organized by colors. Uh, the other day would be by sizes or divided up into if they had one hole or two holes, you know, really, really visually building these taxonomies of objects. And I took so much pleasure in that, that I think I've always been a sort of like a, a data collector or a like organizational freak. Um, so that's, that's the, I think that's probably the first manifestation of this obsession in retrospect it's it's always been there yeah. Yeah. <laughs> um i was i was surprised when when seeing your work how much is actually drawn like you can really see like how you how you use color pen like it's hand drawn it's like there's an analog there's maybe a human component in it um is that intended is it just your your favorite um he, well, I, as a designer, I mean, it's my favorite way of getting to know the data and to have the first path of the data. Then I think sometimes you can use drawing as a final manifestation if the project allows, if it's, it can be artistic. In other moments, even when, say, for example, we created plastic here, the digital experience, there were a lot of sketches in between that. I mean, sketching and drawing for me is the way to understand that I had an idea in the first place. It's just really by only by seeing things and like storyboarding things that I can think. Um, 
I also think in general that when we started the Dear Data project, um, it was a moment still where like data and data visualization was only associated with hardcore software development skills and computer science that you needed to be like really a, a nerd to work with data. And I think that that uh, experiment was aimed at figuring out, you know, like Stephanie and I had this idea that data ultimately is just a way to observe the world and it can be a uh, a creative material to work with because representing data, if you think about it, is just about is only about building rules for yourself. So if blank something in the data set, then I will draw that symbol. So really it's like it's a rule based kind of representation and doing it without technology completely uh, and like drawing it was also a way to get closer to the nature of data, like removing the computer from the equation helped us really figure out uh, what is that we wanted to say. And like without shortcuts from technology, you, you need to get to know your data better. So, I mean, that, that was a long winded answer, I guess, to, to your question. Yeah, thank you. Yeah, let's take a, let's take a few questions from the audience. If you do want to ask your question um, directly, like with your sound and your video on, please just post a cue into the chat or um, please just raise your hand. Um, until anybody does that, I'm just going to take Laura's um, question here. How do you see the future of data visualizations? Um, is it becoming a universal language? Um, I guess especially you mentioned it. Our data has dominated our past 15 or 18 months. Like every day we checked vaccination rates and um, virus counts and all of that has been visualized and become such a big part of our life. Is that going to change our relationship to data in the future? What do you, um, I what mean, do you think? I think Thank you, Laura, for the question. I mean, I think that not only the pandemic data are have been like again part of our daily lives, where we have checked charts and maps as much as photographies of illustrations. So this has become really, you know, really part of the way that we made decisions, and that's really fundamental. But more and more, I mean, we know that we produce data as we breathe. I mean, we in our phones and in our apps, we more and more have data visualizations like charts. So I think it is a language that obviously will become more and more ubiquitous because I think also brands and companies that we like uh, and use, I mean, now as customers, we do know that the companies that we like and use are collecting data about us. And so I think at some point they will also need to give data back to us. So I think also all this conversation about privacy and transparency, hopefully with the good, re the right regulations, we lead to even a more ubiquitous way in which data can become a language that we fluently speak. I mean, there's something that I was thinking about the other day when I was growing up uh, at some point when we needed to decide what to do for college uh, in, in Italy. So English obviously is not my first language. Um, you know, there was people saying, oh, I'm going to go and study English. Other people went and saying, I'm going to go and study computer like, you know, 20 years ago. And I remember one of my high school teacher that said, that's not an option because English and computers are not a subject of study. These need to be known by everybody. This by default, you need to know it. Study something else and learn it as default. And I think right now with data is kind of like the same. It's not necessarily only about, oh, somebody will become a data specialist. Still, there are data specialists right now, but more and more, I think it'll be a thing that we all will need to be fluent in as we are fluent in personal finance, as we're fluent in, you know, other topics. Uh, so that's that's just really what I see. Then I mean nobody can and predict the future but i think that's probably what's going to happen yeah yeah uh, when you when you presented the bruises work um, about cooper and um khaki uh, and and khaki um made a sound piece sound work to to accompany your data visualization we had an interesting question um about like how would like um or basically <laughs> you visualize data for, but like for the visually impaired, um, how would like it work to, to represent data and sound? Um, do you have any examples, um, projects so, about that? Actually, I've, I've worked a lot with Kaki with some other projects and uh, for the 1st project that we worked on together, we presented a piece of music and, and data visualization uh, where Kaki was actually in an, in an opera theater in Cape Town in front of 2000 people. She was playing as the visualization started to go. And so she was actually teaching uh, people and the audience how to read the music and read the data by means of sort of like playing a live 
audio legend in a way. And so I think really the power of sounds and, you know, of course, the different melodies, the tempo, the BPMs, uh, uh, the different pauses to, to represent and visualize data, it's really, really promising for the visually impaired. And I think there's a lot of on data sonification that has already been done and experimented by musicians and data researchers. So it's, uh, it's, it's already there. I think it's always, it's always a matter of making it become, um, more urgent to use. So, for example, I've always seen just experiments that are not really probably visualizing, like, um, let's say, a very serious topic. Uh, I'm sorry, not visualizing, but Sony finding very serious topic. But maybe there are projects that needs to be done about let's just really sonify the data about how our planet will change. Let's sonify the data about COVID. I mean, there's there's a there's a lot of opportunity out there, and I think musicians can really uh, play a lot with it. And we're looking forward to hearing that. We are at the end of our event, but before we do the book giveaway, let me ask one question about the, the postcards um, that were sent across the Atlantic. Uh, we had one question in the chat. How many of these postcards did get lost? <laughs> uh, that's a great question. So. Uh... Three from me and two from Stephanie. So what we used to do before sending the postcard over is that we would scan the postcard so that at least, you know, we had a record. And so I needed to redraw and resend three postcards. Stephanie needed to send two. The other interesting thing is that many of them got to us completely watered by the rain or like really crammed and folded because the mailman crammed it into the thing. So we always like to say Say that the postal service and the mailman were the third party in this collaboration and actually we would be so curious to uh to know what the mailman would think like after one year of like really needing to just send these these postcards you know maybe maybe i would be really curious to hear that but yeah so three got lost for me and two from stephanie beautiful out of out of 52 yeah that's about 10 percent <laughs> um <laughs> Thank you so much. And we are giving away three copies um, of your and Stephanie Kozarek's book, um, uh, Dear Data. And uh, for that giveaway, I'm inviting Catherine to come back on um, because she has done a random draw and we have three names um, and we do want to announce the winners. I do. I actually did some random number picking in the background here. Speaking of data, by the way. And the numbers that I got gave me names, and the names are Vivian Pampas, and I see Vivian on the screen. Congratulations, Vivian. You won one. Congrats. <laughs> then the number generator picked Irina. Irina is also on the screen. So if you want to say hi and wave. Hey, hello. Thank you. <laughs> Irina. <laughs> okay. And then I have Jack Stubbs, but I don't see Jack, so I hope he's still with us. I saw him in the list. Congratulations. I think we can contact everybody via email. Congratulations to uh, to the three winners. And I want to thank everybody. Um, yeah, on behalf of our organizations, let's thank our teams. But most of all, we want to thank Georgia Lupi for this really intriguing presentations. We could continue for another two hours. Thanks everybody um, for staying until the end. Thank you. Fantastic. And we hope to see you all again soon. To see you soon. Enjoy the rest of your week. Thank you, everybody. Thank you so much. And check in again. Bye. Thank Bye. you very much. Thank Goodbye. you. Bye. Bye. Bye.